casual friday here we go nick ryan welcome back thanks nice hi, to brian. Be here. hi ryan it's uh so we are ending the third quarter of the year the last day of september i don't think it can come soon enough for <laughs> any of us uh what do you what are you guys hearing the most uh from the people you're talking to as we finish out the third quarter I think people are most concerned with just what they see on the, obviously what they see on their statement. I don't know necessarily that they know all the pieces that are um, causing that. Meaning that I think most people just assume my account's down. I see it keep coming down and they assume it's the stock market. Um, when in actuality, it's partially the stock market, but just as maybe a largely a, a part of the bond market um, causing problems with their portfolio as well. Yeah. So yeah, I explain that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What about you, Nick? How, what are you hearing or saying? Yeah, they're, you know, I think they're a little bit down about it. Um, definitely, they are. You know, a couple of people I talked to recently. You know, yeah, everyone, everyone's in the same thing. There's, there's no, like Ryan said, no place to to hide almost this year, um, as far as our traditional portfolio goes. And they're willing to to stick it out as we are, and and they trust they trust us to to do what's right. So that's yeah, nice. I mean it's it's been it's been dreadful. I think everybody knows that. I, I get asked a lot like what's going on, why. I mean I think this all comes into um, interest rates and what the how the Federal Reserve or inflation maybe and how the Federal Reserve is responding to inflation mm-hmm. by increasing interest rates because you know it, let's flash back three months now to where we were beginning the third quarter we were coming out of june it looked like we had bottomed we had an inflation report that showed month over month increases of inflation of zero so it's not that it was getting better but it had stopped getting worse that was helpful and we kind of rallied through july and into the beginning of august until again we get a nasty inflation report we got the federal reserve at jackson hole talking tough and then of course that follows through to september um so as we were, were getting ready to go into this, you can kind of see the headlines as we were finishing up uh, with the S&P falling as we were kind of finishing out. It really lost steam. You know, we were holding on kind of break even a little bit earlier today, but then we kind of puked into the end. It's mm-hmm. the third straight quarterly loss that we've had. It's the worst September since 2008. That's a bit of a weird statistic because, you know, who's tracking just September's and it's, it's almost like financial media does anything to invoke 2008 to get eyeballs on this stuff, but it is the worst month since March of 2020. And I mean, that was a pretty nasty month. September has been rough. Uh, There's no doubt about it. There's no doubt about it. Um, So like we usually do, we've got some charts and some slides and some things that we can kind of use as the basis of our discussion. Um, Many of these are coming from JP Morgan Asset Management. Some are coming from the Capital Group, which other people know as American Funds. So we can kind of dig in here. Uh, And Ryan, do you kind of want to run with this first one? This We're talking about consumer confidence. And if we're talking about how clients, where we're we're talking with people and talking with clients, talk with Money managers, you know, everybody's feeling pretty sour on things. And I think that's what's reflected here in this consumer confidence report. Yeah. So just a quick explanation of what this is. So this is the consumer sentiment index. It's just a it's a measurement. It's a survey basically of how people feel about their financial situation currently. Um, and so, you know, you can survey these people and then put them put it into a new, you know, numerical chart to, to kind of tell where people have been. Um, feeling about over the course of time. So really, the higher the index is, as you can see, the the blue dots at the top is when people are feeling pretty good about their financial situation. Um, Obviously, as the the chart heads downwards, um, people continually feel worse and worse about their financial situation. Um, You can see, you know, currently and kind of compared to times in the past, you know, 50 years, um, you can kind of see we did bottom out technically, but you know, we are at towards the bottom of any time in which this index has been around, um, showing that, you know, people aren't feeling great about their, their, their situation. And of course, I think a large part of that plays into inflation. And then, you know, some of it's probably what they fear about may happen in the future as well. I, I think, you know, people are, the word recession is being tossed around a lot too. And that, that scares people. Yeah. I think, I wish we had a pointer on this software program that we're using to kind of webcast this because you can see there are peaks and there are troughs, but I think importantly is that little box up in the top left. 
that's talking about the subsequent average subsequent 12 month S and P 500 returns. So when you hit trough and we are a consumer sentiment is as low as it was lower than 2008, when we hit bottom lower than 2008, lower than 2011, lower than 2020. I mean, you have to go back to 1980 when we were going through similar inf- inflationary pressures, you know, where consumer sentiment was and the, the, Average 12 month return after we've the sentiment has hit bottom for the S&P 500 has been nearly 25%. So it, I think this confirms, and Nick, maybe you can chime in on this as well, that when you're feeling crummy about things is, is probably the best time to get invested or stay invested or add to your investments, maybe even. Right. Yeah, that's, I think, uh, something that a lot of market uh, participants would say is when the, the fear... Uh, which which would be somewhat similar to this. The fear index gets uh, pretty high, and then it's typically a good time to buy. And and yeah, like you said, it looks like the August reading was was even lower than than the September reading. So you know maybe we bottomed out, and and you know, obviously the last couple of weeks haven't borne that out as far as bottoming in the stock market. But yep, what can you do? Well, it's um, this is about eight, like ignoring your instincts, maybe even. <laughs> Right. Um, I, I know we didn't talk about doing this, but I'm going to throw this up here. Um, this is the I'm going to share my screen over here. Um, I, you mentioned the, the fear index. This is the fear and greed index for CNN. Right. And we are totally at the extreme fear category. This is where the investments um, as we go forward could be pretty good. But well, I'm, I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back to the 2008 comment that you kind of made, Brian. I mean, I, I remember back. It was you know we usually get our statements somewhere around the seventh, eighth, ninth, you know, of of the month. Yeah. Um, and back in 2008, you know, March of 2008, right when it was the bottom, I do remember clients calling in, ready to throw in the flat, you know, ready to throw in the towel. Yeah. Um, and you know, it's at that point, which is. You're at the panic mode when you're at the extreme end of the fear index and you're ready to just call it quits. You know, that's oftentimes the time that, you know, it's towards the bottom and you shouldn't be panicking. Sure. I think the technical term is capitulation, right? Mm -hmm. That's where everybody throws in the towel and gives up. And that's when you least want to do it. I mean, you've, we've come this far. You've been going down for nine months. Right. Uh, You don't, don't turn around now, you know, um, well, let's move on to the next slide so we don't so we don't take the, an hour for today's casual Friday. But uh, uh, this is an interesting chart because it talks about how how much what in terms of returns and time you need to bounce back um, from where we peaked in January, and then also give some bull market and bear market stuff. Uh, um, I, Nick, do you want to run with this one and kind of introduce it to everybody, and we can talk a little bit more? Yeah. Sure, sure. So right on the left side, the first chart there just shows what you would need to get back to that January 2022 peak of 47.97, right? So if we did it in a year, we'd have a 29% return, which I think we would all be be happy about. But even as you go down, if it's, you know, two years, 14% annual um, return, three years, 10%, four years, 8%, five years, um, almost 7%. So any one of those, if we got, you know, five years of 7% returns, yeah, it would take a while. And, you know, it would, we'd like to get there a little bit faster, but, you know, 7% is, is, you know, kind of a, um, a really long-term average. I think 10% is kind of a shorter, maybe more intermediate term average. So if we got that and then it'd be three well, years. And- I'll tell you what, Nick, I'm, I'm just looking right now on Investopedia and the average According to Investopedia, the average annualized return for the S and P since 1957 through the end of last year is 11.88 percent. Okay. So if we got below average returns three years in a row, we'd be break even. If we just got mm-hmm. average returns three years in a row, it would take let's split the two to three two years, and a half years. Yeah, right? two to three years. Which, yeah. Um. So this is not a hole that we can't dig out of, right, Ryan? Mm-hmm. Right, right. And I think that the one thing I think people need to realize is like when things go down a lot, it becomes almost like that a rubber band effect where sure. when things eventually start to come up, they don't th- th- that first six months, that first year is usually not 
just like climbing up very slowly, methodically, like that first, especially that probably that first six months that the market starts to actually go up is pretty fast. And so you can't afford to miss that because if you skip that and then, then, then your, then your time period may become four or five years because you missed such a large return that first six months that the market started to come back. And it's now going to, you know, now it's after the, after the six months, it takes just time for a longer, longer time. It's a longer slog to, to, to get your returns back. Right. Well, but, and I'll give you an example. You know, we were taught, we started this talking about what went on in June and how June for a little while appeared to be the bottom until it became clear after the fact that it was a, a bear market rally or a dead cat bounce. If you're less than PC, um, the, the rally from the bottom, I think was 17%. Mm-hmm. So we cut our losses pretty significantly over what is that? Seven weeks. I think. Yeah. There, about a month and a half yeah. Um, so yeah. I mean the yeah. I mean one year is unlikely, but two years is also almost kind of unlikely because the returns can be so good from the bottom, you know. Um, I don't know. It's not going to take forever to bounce back from that. I, that, I think that's really the, for, from what we're in right now. I think that's the takeaway. Um, one that we'll spend a little bit of time on, but I thought was a, a another useful look at this was um, fixed income. And I know everybody kind of likes to talk about stock markets and what's going on with stocks. A lot of people own bonds in their portfolio. Um, I, I think that what the takeaway from this is, is that we are getting better than average yields on every single category of bonds. And so even though bonds have been getting killed, this is kind of, is just yet another example that as you go forward, the yields on bonds are now less insulting than they've been for so long. You can see on the far left side, treasuries are at 4% instead of 1.4. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the bonds look much more attractive going forward from here. And so with higher yields, they also act as that kind of buffer, I think, or do a better job of being the buffer that a lot of people expect them to be when they have a mixed portfolio of stocks and bonds. So yeah, well, I think this is the, maybe the silver lining of the bond market going down, right? Because we just never have experienced this kind of you know bond downturn, and um, with it, you know, bonds being down sixteen percent or so right now, your yields become much more attractive to where in the future you're going to get paid more. You also have the potential, you know, for appreciation on your bonds really at this point. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. You know, when, when, it, when interest rates are at zero, your bonds just don't have much room to appreciate. Um, right. They can give you some interest, but they don't have much um, upside. Right now, it's fair to say that there's, there's upside in the future for, for the bonds. Sure. You know, sure. I think yeah, we've pretty, had, pretty clear. yeah, this goes back 10 years. So, you know, since the, and even further back, probably since the, uh, you know, and we've had zero interest rate policy since the, the financial crisis and yeah. started to started to bring those up in 2018 uh, and, and then quickly reversed. And obviously uh, with the pandemic brought them back down to zero. Um, but that's kind of, I think Brian, you mentioned it off air kind of along the same lines as, as 2018, some of the same or some of the similarities. Yeah. We're seeing pal, today. Pal are uh, pal, uh, talking tough interest rate increases are on autopilot was the word that he used in 2018. And then the first week of January 2019, he goes on 60 minutes, takes his foot out of his mouth, says, oh, we're not going to be quite as aggressive on rate hikes. And bang, 2019 was a huge year. Um, 2019 was certainly enough. Just going back to the last slide. I'm not saying history is going to repeat itself, but this one year on the, on the left side of the chart here was the kind of return that we got in 2019 as we followed that. So mm-hmm. I, it's not all the same. It's not, but it just goes to show how, how important interest rate data is, or inflation data is. And then the federal response to federal uh, reserve response to with the interest rates. Um, the next si- slide we have here are uh, valuation measures and, you know, we're going a little bit longer than we normally do. So I won't spend much time here. This basically, um, this looks at forward PE ratio. So you're you're looking at um, the price of a stock versus the forward estimated earnings on um, kind of the cumulative S and P 500 here, and you can kind of see the 25 year average is somewhere just below 17 times earnings, and we are at as of September 22nd, just below 16 times earnings. So a little bit cheaper stocks right now are a little bit cheaper than the historical average, but not not absolutely cheap going back you know the last 25 years 
I think what gets missed here is because there's a little bit of line and there's a little line here. And I think I might try and upload this. If we're going to, if we're going to turn this audio here into a podcast, I'll try and put these charts in the show notes of the podcast. But importantly, you can see on the last on the value last of that valuation measure box that we're looking at here, the uh, earnings yield spread versus the uh, BAA yield. Basically, um, stocks are cheap compared to bonds still. And I think that's something that gets is in the nuance here of this valuation chart. So are stocks cheap historically? Yeah, a little bit cheaper than average. We're about to go into earnings season, so this could change pretty dramatically also. But also, stocks are cheap compared to bonds, and that's an important takeaway. Yeah, I think the one thing I would add, too, to this is that it's definitely good not to be you know, on the top end of that chart where we, where we were, right? Just because oh, yes. eventually you're, you're, you're setting yourself up for a large fall. I mean, again, this chart just chart's not historically, you know, a hundred years, but it, it, you can see that on the left side of the chart, what happens in the nineties. And we all know the nineties were, were the market was, you know, super really? good. Um, yeah. But then the, there was large consequences for many years afterwards of the, the returns just getting um, out of whack. So, Coming back to the median sometimes allows us to have a reset. I, I sometimes tell clients that, you know, we, we need to expect to have bad markets, you know, once every five or six years or so. And, you know, may, maybe this is our one year, we get it out of the way and, you know, you might see better markets for the next four or five years. Sure, sure. I think that's a real possibility. Um, let's move on to uh, one of the slides that I think we reference this maybe every single time we do a casual Friday um yeah i mean nick you're familiar with this one you want to run with this right yeah so this is the you know annual returns and as it says on top inter entry year decline so the red uh dots are how far the market fell in any given year and the black bars is where they ended up so you can see uh, we've been you know i think it's probably i think it's 14 percent or so is the average drawdown yeah there it is um exactly 14% and then but we still get positive returns 75% of the time yep uh roughly uh, i think interestingly this so this chart is a week it, it's if you look on the bottom data is as of september 22nd so it's it's about a week old and with what the market has done these last couple of days we're actually the s&p's down about 24% so at its lows of the year mm -hmm. i think right. if so this uh, you go back to 1980 I'm looking at it right now. I still don't see a year where the the S and P finished the year at its low for the year, which is where we are at this very moment as we in the third quarter. So the yeah, so likelihood, look, yeah, it's a good sign. It's a good yeah, sign. We that, could go yeah, lower from improvement. Here. We could, but chances that we finish at the year's low on December 31st, well, it's zero out of 42 times as we're looking at this right here so um you know again we make we could go lower from here but i think we're closer to the end than the beginning uh, is is one of the takeaways that we have um we added these last couple of slides kind of just at the end um because i think really well a lot of what's getting priced in right now whether we're talking and there's plenty of crazy it feels like the world's hanging on by a thread for a lot of people right you have mm -hmm. Uh, hurricanes decimating Florida. We've got a midterm election coming up. We've got uh, the UK kind of stepping on its feet at every turn with their fiscal and monetary policy. We've got saber rattling going on with Putin in the Ukraine, you know, and then we've got all of this. Um, but the reality is that when we are looking at recessions, they often, we're not in a recession yet, but if we're faced with a recession, um, this is from the Capital Group, which does American funds. You can see the average recession is 10 months, uh, and that's average. And you can see, I think importantly, compared to expansionary periods, recessions are shallow and brief. Um, so a lot of that's getting priced in right now. We might be overdoing it, perhaps. Maybe. Yeah. yeah, I mean, relating that to the markets, you know, a recession oftentimes causes a bear market. Um, they think, what do they say? The saying is, you know, the market takes the stairs up, but the elevator down, right? So it's just things happen quickly on the downside. Um, and it makes it all that more emotional because things are happening so fast. The numbers, the values on statements um, are, are happening so fast. And then when you go up, it just seems like it's, you know, it's a slow process and it's, it's, it's dictated in this chart. Like it, it, yeah, it can it, be slow, but it goes on for a really long time. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. The big thing, obviously the blue is bigger than the 
maroon. I suppose. Yeah. And, the, and our last slide is it's it's similar a little bit, Nick, to the one you, you were addressing a little bit earlier. Um, mm -hmm. The time frame isn't as long because this goes back to 1950, but it's also talking about the average bear market. And if we're, you know, we're 19 months into the or 19, if we're nine months into this exactly, don't you think this suggests to us that we may be closer to the finish? Yeah, definitely, definitely. The average is 13, and and we've seen, like you said, a 24 percent drawdown. So, yeah, like you said, it might get a little bit worse, but uh, it should be closer, hopefully closer to the end than than not. Yeah, not to be a pessimist here, but one of the other advisors in our office, Steve Jolly, has said, I think he said, the average temperature in Fresno is something like 80 degrees, right? So be wary of averages, right? Because it's <laughs> yeah. 115 or 30 or whatever it is. But um, it does it does tell you as you are hitting close to averages that the odds become stronger and stronger with each passing day, month, and quarter that you're closer to the end than the beginning, even as you pull past that average number. So. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I would say it's, it's pretty clear we're running out of time to get back to all time highs before the year is out. Um, I just still haven't given up hope that in the shorter term, I think we really can cut our losses. Some important dates as like, as we kind of bring this to a close, some important dates that we've got coming forward for everybody. Uh, the CPI report is coming out October 13th. So that's our next chance to get a meaningful. Inf I mean, I know we had that the, the core report coming out here this week, but CPI, which is the one that everybody pays attention to, that's October 13th. Earnings season starts October 14th. Fed meeting starts November 1st. And then the election is November 8th. So we've got three weeks starting the middle of October that are going to be pretty influential over the next I, at least couple of months, right? Um, yeah, I think I tell clients that it seems as though the the most focused right now for the market, at least, is on inflation. You know, but we only get inf real inflation numbers once a month, and so those numbers become really important to kind of guide us and what the market may do. Um, the right. markets. It seems like you know, there was back in the day earnings would you know make things very volatile. Right now, I feel like inflation reports make things very volatile right now. Yeah, well, and it's tough. Inflation reports are backward look, like like any data. Like, mm -hmm. you know, when we're obsessed about unemployment rates, you know, it's all backward looking. None's more backward looking than unemployment numbers. But it's telling us how inflation was doing. And it's like trying to drive a car just looking in the rearview mirror. Um, but that's what we're doing here. So I guess that's what we're left to kind of focus on. Right. Yeah. That's all they have. So that's what they'll lean on. Yeah. Well, good. Well, I think, we, you know, we're pushing past about 20 minutes here. We'll leave it here. Uh, we'll try and rip the audio from this to post it on our podcast also. And I'll try and include some of the charts that we went over in the show notes so people can listen to this as well. Um, but we'll leave it. We'll leave it there until next casual Friday, guys. Have a good weekend. Yeah, you Thanks, too. Thanks, Ryan. All right. Bye -bye. Have a good one.